Hi, my name is Paul Meeks. I'm the president of Worthington Products in Canton, Ohio. And for the next 20 minutes, I'm going to share with you some practical guidance based on the leading best practices for signage around dams. In these next five slides, we're going to look at the key elements that make a sign effective. And we're going to start with the color of the sign, the background color versus text color. You want your color to stand out. Typically, it's going to be red for a danger sign or yellow for a warning sign. And your text color wants to stand out against that background color. So if you have a red sign, you want white lettering. If you have a yellow sign, you want black lettering. Once we move from color, we want to start thinking about what words are going to be on our signs. And the first word we want to look at is our headline word, also known as your signal word. This is something that's going to convey instant understandability. In this case, on a danger sign, we want the word danger. On a warning sign, we want the word warning. It can't be any simpler than that. Following the establishment of our headline, we then move on to the message text. This is really the meat of the sign. This is where we convey the message to the folks approaching our dams to tell them what the danger is and also what action we expect of them. So we refer to this as the message text. Our first line of message text is where we have the opportunity to define the hazard for the folks approaching our dams. And we want to keep this simple. And in, in the example we show here, we're saying dam ahead. We're not saying the type of dam. We're not giving the color, the length, or anything else. All we're doing is saying dam ahead. So on our first line of message text, we define the hazard, dam ahead. Now the second line is where we have the opportunity to tell the people what action we expect. In this case, we're saying dam ahead, the action we require, keep away, keep out, something like that. And the final element of a proper sign is going to be the identifier panel. Now this is a panel that is situated at the bottom of the sign and it's going to include the name of the dam or in the case of a power generating station, the name of that power plant. Beneath that, we're going to have where the person needs to call for an emergency number, 911 or a 24-hour staffed control center if you have one. Uh, we suggest you put your company logo on there. And then one thing we're not showing on here, but that is something that's used, especially in areas where you have multiple languages, is we might also want to include a pictogram panel on the left side of the sign. And I'm not showing that. It would be a separate panel. Those are the key elements of an effective sign. Now, where do we get these elements from? Well, you'll see them in the Canadian Dam Association, the Corps of Engineers, and FERC, but really they all emanate from the ANSI standards, ANSI standard Z535.2. The challenge on that standard is that it's a very thick document. It covers a lot of ground, a lot of industries, and essentially what CDA and the Corps of Engineers on their standards have done is uh, they pulled out the relevant portions of it to put it into a more manageable document. And that's what I'm presenting to you today. So we're going to go over each of these sign elements in more detail. But before we do that, let's take a quick moment just to talk about sign placement. Because you can have the greatest sign known to mankind. But if you put it in the wrong location, if you don't put it in a proper spot, it's going to be totally ineffective. So the goal of sign placement is to assure that viewers are not trapped in an unsafe area by the time they can see and read the sign. And the image we're showing on the left, this is an actual dam on the Muskingum River just south of Worthington's offices in Ohio. Um, fortunately, in 2019, David Kassler and his wife were kayaking down the river. She was able to exit the river, but by the time he saw this teeny little sign sitting on the dam, it was too late. He was already trapped in an unsafe area. His kayak went over the dam, and he was uh, caught in the boil zone, and unfortunately, he passed away. So we want science to be put in the right location so this does not happen. We see a lot of dams. We see a lot of sign placement at dams that's based on convenience and not based on strategic decision-making. And this is an image from an actual client of ours out west. And on the right side of the image, there's a boat ramp. They have an outhouse out there. They have a large board posted, and it has multiple small signs on it. I don't think any individual sign is more than 18 inches by 24 inches. This location is 500 feet away from the dangerous waters where we want to keep people out of. And to make this really good, they posted the signs right by the outhouse. 
Now, had they used a strategic approach to sign placement, they would have considered what are the activities around the dam. And they would have put actual signs at the buoy line because if you can look at the bottom of this image, you'll see an orange squiggly line. What happens if someone is approaching the dam and they didn't enter the water at that boat ramp? So they're on a paddleboard, a kayak, a canoe, whatever, and they're coming along the southern shoreline. Well, they never would have seen any of those signs that indicate that there's a danger area up ahead. So that's why we want to have our signs at the start, just above the danger zone where an individual is not in uh, turbulent water or high flow water and they have a chance to turn around. And that's what we're showing on here. Now, another consideration is also what's taking place below the dam. And in this case, we have a series of spill gates. So if there is evidence of public access below the dam, we also want to make sure that we have signs where the public would be accessing those areas. And here we show an example of an access sign below the dam. Here's an image of that sign panel I mentioned with all the small signs located next to the outhouse. But what we really want to get across on this slide is Think about your messaging, what you are saying, and more importantly, what you are not saying and how things might be interpreted. So in this case, there's an actual sign on this panel, and it has a wonderful pictogram that indicates no boating. And the sign actually reads, Danger, in the interest of public safety, fishing or boating is not permitted between the buoys and dam. So my question to you, we didn't say swimming is not allowed. So does that mean swimming is allowed? So we need to think about our messaging. Here's an example of a perfect public safety around dam sign. So what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to deconstruct this sign. We're going to take a look at the original slides we had, color, headline, message text, uh, bottom panels, and we're going to dive in a little deeper onto each of those elements to give you an understanding as to why these are important for the sign. So we're going to start off with color. Sign color is critical to conveying meaning and the color combinations between your background color and your lettering will greatly affect the legibility and effectiveness of your sign. Fortunately, ANSI Z535, the Corps of Engineers, the Canadian Dam Association, and even the U.S. Federal Highway Administration all recognize two commonalities. That first commonality is going to be a danger sign. We want a danger sign that's going to be red. It's a red background with white lettering. Second, if we have a warning sign, we want to have a warning sign yellow background with black lettering. And the reason for the red and white and the yellow and black is because those provide the highest contrast, which makes them the easiest to read. Now, there's a lot of science behind this, and we're not getting into that in this presentation, but they have the highest contrast, and therefore, they're going to be the easiest to read. Your headline, some folks also refer to it as a signal word or a sign legend. Key thing here, it's a single word. It is a word that is universally recognized because of its brevity and clarity, and it is a word that by itself elicits an immediate reaction. And again, I'm saying word, not words, as in plural. We're going to use a danger sign when the risk is high. When the risk is high that there's going to be a death or severe injury, that's when we want to use a red sign with white lettering. When the risk is low, there could be a minor injury, but it's not life-threatening and it's not going to require an ambulance or a hospital run. When the risk is low, we're going to use a warning sign, which is going to be a yellow sign with black lettering. Typically, your warning signs are going to be above a danger zone or below a danger zone if you're, if you're below a dam. Okay, so we looked at the headline, which is either going to be danger or warning. Now we want to take a look at the message. This is what we're conveying, and my suggestion to you is to apply the three-second rule, and that is you want your signs to be concise and to the point and have at-a-glance understandability. Now there's another reason for this as well. The more words you have on a sign, the larger it needs to be, which means your signs are going to be bigger and your costs of making that sign are going to be higher. So three-second rule, concise, at a glance understandable. How does that look on the sign? Well, your message text on line one, you want to define what the danger is, and on line two, you want to state the action and or inform about the consequences. And I'm going to give you some examples of, of defining the danger and stating the action improperly and properly on this next slide. 
Here are two examples about defining the danger. The top is the roundabout way, and these are actual examples that we've seen around the United States. And on the bottom is a proper way, that's a direct and concise way. So ungated spillway ahead, low head dam ahead, hydroelectric power plant downstream. I'm not even gonna read that next paragraph about sirens. But basically, think about this. The recreational public, a lot of these people, they don't know what it means to say an ungated spillway. They have no clue what a low head dam is. They might not even know what a hydroelectric power plant is. And by the way, it doesn't even matter. Really, what are we trying to say? We're trying to say, folks, there's a dam ahead, or there's a dam outflow, or a dam upstream. People understand that, and it hits our rule of concise and to the point and at a glance understandability. Depending on the orientation of our sign, we have some flexibility. If the sign is facing the water, we want it to be very specific, very legible and readable quickly. So in this case, on the left side, you see a water facing sign. We say danger. What is the danger? Dam ahead. What action? Keep away. Plain and simple. However, if the approach to the sign is going to be slower, so if someone's coming approaching the sign by land, that point in time, we can put a little more information on the sign. In this case, we're still saying danger, but we're combining our hazard definition and our action statement on the first line. Dam upstream, keep out, or we could say dam ahead, keep out. And then we're gonna provide a consequence statement. Why are we saying keep out? Because this riverbed floods without warning. But with both of these examples, they're very concise, they're to the point, and they meet our standard of at a glance understandability. All around us, we see signs that are always all capitalized. Well, here's something you might not know. A sign that is set in all caps is going to take 14% more time to read, and it's going to require 40% more space, so your signs are going to be more expensive. And all caps is less readable and less legible than lowercase text. Now, ANSI and CDA do recognize that capitalized words do have a place on a sign, and that place is in your headline. So your headline word can be all caps because that headline word by and of itself is a signal word. However, the message text, no matter how many lines of message text you have, only the first letter of each word should be in caps. The rest should be lowercase. Just like caps being very important and aiding in readability, the same goes for sign fonts. Now, ANSI recommends that you use the sans serif fonts family. However, that covers a whole range of fonts, including Times New Roman in Georgia. So the best sans serif font that you can use is going to be one that's simple and it's quickly comprehended by the viewer. You want to avoid using a font because it looks good, you know, or is aesthetically pleasing. Your sign, keep in mind, is not an art project. So what fonts do you want to use? Either Helvetica, Helvetica Bold, or Arial, Arial Bold. Most people can't tell the difference between either one. So Helvetica Bold or Arial Bold. We stated earlier how a sign set in all caps is going to take 14% more time to read. The same goes for how you align your sign. You do not want to line your sign center alignment. You always want to use left aligned or what's called ragged right text. And this is an ANSI statement, an ANSI standard. And the reason for that is left aligning a sign aids in readability because the eye naturally looks for a vertical line. It helps it to comprehend the sign quicker. So by left aligning your sign, the individual viewing it is going to have a much easier time comprehending it. Hence, they're going to get through the sign a lot faster. The actual physical size of the sign is going to be based on the number of words that you have on that sign and the height, the lettering height of each of those words. Now, your signs are going to be designed for a person with 20-40 vision and the text height on the sign is going to be based on the first capital letter in the message panel. That might be a surprise to some of you. We do not use the headline as the definer for the lettering height. So our text height is going to be based on several factors. It's going to be based on the distance from which it's to be viewed, the approach speed of an individual, the manner of movement. Are they coming by a boat, car, or foot? And that relates to the approach speed. Also the light conditions and perhaps even what the angle of the sign is to the approach. So your message text height 
That's what we're sizing our sign for in terms of lettering height. We call the first capital letter the A dimension. Your signal or headline word is going to be a minimum of 1.5 times that A dimension in the message panel. And your optimal viewing angle for designing your signs should be 45 degrees or less. You'll find some variation out there as to letter height to viewing distance, but generally ANSI, FERC, CDA, Corps of Engineers all fall in around 2.8 millimeter letter height per meter of viewing distance. Imperial, that's going to be about 0.034 inches per foot of viewing distance. Now this is based on favorable viewing and light conditions. If you know you're in a low light area or you're in an area where there, your sign's angled too much or something like that, you may want to have those letters higher. And remember, this is the A dimension. Finally, in prior illustrations, we showed this identifier panel on the bottom of the sign. This is a separate panel, and it's going to include the name of the dam or the generating station, and then it's also going to include an emergency number. Now, if you look at this sign example that I'm showing here, you see an 888 number. This is an actual phone number. It's not 911. So the reason the sign can have that is because this is a sign with Ontario Power Generation, and they just so happen to have a control center that is staffed 24-7. So if you call into this, their people are intimately familiar with the Caribou Falls Generating Station. If you don't have a 24-7 staffed control center, in that case, you're going to put on that sign 911. Just make sure that you have your 911 operators trained so they also recognize where these generating stations are located. Now, can you put other panels underneath these identifiers? Absolutely you can. Uh, in this case here, they're, they're showing that there's video surveillance under there, the sign, and they're pointing out to people, you know, what the law is requiring that. So you can add these additional panels. They will be separate panels aside from the primary sign, which you see above. You can make your sign out of whatever material you want, but if you want a sign that's going to last, I would suggest that you use a high tensile aluminum material, a 5052, and then you're going to put a 3M retro reflective high intensity prismatic sheeting on top. The reason we have that is because it picks up light fantastically and it really helps to reflect and to highlight the lettering or graphics that you have on your sign. And then finally, your lettering is going to be either screen printed or digital printed onto the sign. Just make sure that however you do it, your screening inks that you use on your sign are rated to last the life of the sheeting. You wouldn't want to put a sign with the sheeting that lasts 12 years and your ink start fading after two years. So keep that in mind when designing and specifying your signs. You've gone through all the processes of creating a proper sign, you've located it, you've put the correct lettering on it, you have the colors and everything else. Now you want to make sure that you have a care and maintenance plan around it because if you put the sign in and after 12 months it's shot with holes, it's vandalized, or there's a bush or a tree growing in front of it, again, it is zero effectiveness. So develop an annual inspection and maintenance plan for your signs to upkeep them and to make sure that there is nothing obstructing their proper view. Thank you for your time in viewing this presentation. We just barely scratched the surface on proper sign policy for dam owners. There is a white paper available. You'll see my contact information on here. Please, if you'd like that white paper, contact me by email or phone, and I'll be happy to send it to you. I also have a QR code here. If you scan that, there's a short informative video that I think you'll find. Uh, it's somewhat amusing, but serious content. Thank you so much, and I hope to hear from you about that white paper.